the bell of Gion Monastery in India echoes with the warning of the impermanence of all things. The blossoms of the Sala trees teach us through their hues that what flourishes must fade. The proud do not long endure, but vanish like a spring night's dream. Even the bold and brave will perish in the end. All are as dust before the wind. Tale of the Heike, Chapter 1 Hello everyone, and welcome to the Buyuden Japanese History Channel. My returning viewers will know this channel for my Japanese History the Textbook series of videos, where I am endeavoring to take Japanese language school history textbooks and visualize them into an English YouTube video series. Today's video, however, will be straying slightly from that theme, as we stop to make a deep dive on one of the most important socio-political events in pre-modern Japanese history, the Jisho Jue Disturbance, otherwise known as the Genpei War. This era-defining conflict, famously recounted in the epic narrative known as the Heike Monogatari, or the Tale of the Heike, brought about the end of Japan's 400-year-long Heian period, and ushered in the first era of rule by a warrior-centric government, the Kamakura Bakufu, or the Kamakura Shogunate. As such, it is also widely regarded as marking the transition in Japanese history from the ancient era to the medieval one. The war is fundamentally a conflict between Japan's two great warrior clans, the Taira and the Minamoto, although I see it as more of a three-way struggle with the imperial court, led by retired Emperor Goshirakawa, serving as a fickle and influential third actor. To understand the lead-up to this war, I highly recommend checking out my four-part series of videos recounting the full history of the Heian period, but I will do my best to make this video interesting even for those with minimal background knowledge. This is going to be a very long video, so I will leave timestamps down in the description so that it's easier to pick up and leave off for those of you who'd prefer to watch it more episodically. Finally, before we get started here, I do want to make a brief caveat regarding dates and ages. Pre-modern accounts of the Genpei War use the old Japanese calendar, meaning that month and day numbers do not exactly match up with their Gregorian calendar counterparts, and modern books on the subject tend to use an inconsistent mix of the two. I will be telling this story chronologically, but I have not gone through with a fine-toothed comb to make sure that all of the dates are consistent to one calendar or the other, so I encourage you to look up for yourself any events whose dates you want to be absolutely sure of. Similarly, the pre-modern Japanese used the East Asian style of age counting, in which a person was aged one at birth and that number then increased by one at the turn of every subsequent new calendar year. In this case, I have tried to stick to the modern Western age calculation style, but some things may have slipped through the cracks, so please just bear that in mind. Anyway, with that out of the way, we have a lot to talk about today, so let's get into our story. Taira no Kiyomori By 1167, Taira no Kiyomori was arguably the most powerful man in Japan. The emperor had just proclaimed him Daijo Daijin, Grand Chancellor of the Realm, ancient Japan's equivalent to the office of Prime Minister, and unlike most of his aristocratic peers, he was also in possession of the private military muscle to back up his elite political status. You see, Taira no Kiyomori belonged to a group which history scholars refer to as the Bushi, a stratum of Japanese society that specialized in the arts of war as a sort of esteemed family tradition. From the point of view of a commoner, the bushi were without a doubt on the aristocratic side of the social spectrum, but the position they occupied within that aristocratic world was hardly an exalted one. They were the bodyguards, the enforcers, the men whose job it was to keep the brigands and would-be rebels in check so that the truly blue-blooded families of Kyoto could continue to collect a paycheck from their far-flung territories and maintain their status and lifestyle. 
Indeed, it was their role as subordinates of the aristocratic elite that led in the first place to them being termed samurai, those who serve the noble. However, this status quo began to greatly shift during the time of Kiyomori's father and grandfather, who combined their family's traditional military might with a new level of political savvy and business acumen to reach a position of influence in the Heian Imperial Court that smashed all precedents and expectations for their social class. It was Kiyomori himself who brought this multi-generational endeavor to its triumphant completion defending the imperial house through two violent internal conflicts, the Hogan and Heiji disturbances, and in the process proving himself and his warriors to be the glue holding the political system together. Moreover, in the second of these two disturbances, Kiyomori's Taira had dealt a crippling blow to one of their greatest competitors, Japan's other great bushi warrior clan, the Seiwa Genji, known to us colloquially as the Minamoto. Their chieftain, Minamoto no Yoshitomo, had been savagely murdered during the conflict's conclusion, and his two eldest sons, aged 20 and 16 respectively, had met a tragic fate as well. A number of younger sons, mere boys, also remained to the late Minamoto chieftain, but Taira no Kiyomori, seemingly satisfied with having neutered his rivals for the foreseeable future, chose to spare the children's lives in exchange for their exile from the capital. He then set about absorbing his rival's old vassals by calling them to Kyoto in turns to serve guard duty under his supervision for periods of three years at a time. In the years that followed his victory over the Minamoto, Kiyomori gradually found himself welcomed deeper and deeper into the upper echelons of the aristocratic world, and he made absolutely sure to bring his relatives and offspring along for the ride. Within just a few years of Kiyomori attaining the aforementioned chancellor position, 16 other members of his Ise Taira clan would reach the status of Kugyo, the top tier of the Heian aristocracy, and more than 30 members of the clan would receive the Shoden privilege, allowing entry to the sitting emperor's personal living quarters. Not only that, but roughly half of the land in the country would become the Chigyokoku, or proprietary provinces of the Ise Taira. The clan's fortunes were so superb that Kiyomori's brother-in-law, Taira no Tokitada, is said to have remarked, Heike ni arazumba, hito ni arazu. If you're not a Taira, you're not anyone at all. Rumors even swirled among the residents of the capital that Kiyomori was in fact the secret illegitimate child of the late emperor Shirakawa. His mother was, after all, a former lover of the deceased monarch. And how else could one explain Kiyomori's meteoric rise if not by the magic of royal blood? Whether this rumor was grounded in truth or not, it was certainly clear that the Taira were fast encroaching on the imperial throne, as Kiyomori's sister-in-law, Taira no Shigeko, had already borne a son for the patriarch of the imperial family, the retired emperor Goshirakawa. It should be noted that Shigeko hailed from a non-warrior branch of the Kamu Taira, which was quite distant from Kiyomori's own branch, but their in-law relationship meant that the two families were still connected quite intimately. Just three months after being appointed Grand Chancellor, Kiyomori resigned from the position. Its mere presence on his resume would ensure that his progeny were now qualified for any position within the imperial bureaucracy. But Kiyomori himself had become more than powerful enough to no longer have need of political titles. The following year, Kiyomori experienced a close brush with death during a particularly severe illness, and although he ultimately recovered, the incident led him to enter the Buddhist priesthood and, superficially at least, discard his secular life. This would technically be the moment when Kiyomori took on the shaved head appearance that most history fans identify him with, but many pre-modern illustrations portray him this way even in depictions of chronologically earlier events. After receiving his second lease on life, Kiyomori chose to abandon the capital and relocate to a villa he kept in a place called Fukuhara, the location of the modern-day city of Kobe. He would maintain this as his permanent residence for the rest of his life, thereafter only returning to Kyoto to deal with situations of political or military emergency. The Ise Taira clan had built their multi-generational wealth in large part thanks to engaging in maritime trade, particularly with merchants from Song, China, 
and Kiyomori's choice to move his base of operations to Fukuhara was strongly motivated by a desire to return to a more active participation in this family business. Just south of Fukuhara was an ancient port called Owara no Tomari, and Kiyomori poured his energy into its restoration and improvement in the years following his departure from the capital. 1168 also marked the year when Kiyomori completed the expansion of Itsukushima Shrine on the coast of Aki Province, traditionally held to be a shrine of a guardian god of the sea. Kiyomori, who had in his younger days served as governor of Aki Province, found it a natural target of worship for him and his seafaring clan, famously dedicating a set of 33 resplendently decorated Buddhist sutras to the shrine. These sutras, known as the Heike no Kyo, include a sample of handwriting from Kiyomori himself and have survived to the present day as a masterpiece of late Heian period art and an embodiment of the era's artistic sense. Finally, as if 1168 wasn't busy enough, this was also the year when Kiyomori's seven-year-old nephew, the son of sister-in-law Shigeko and retired emperor Goshirakawa, was elevated to the imperial throne as Emperor Takakura. Although the boy was not exactly the closest relative to Kiyomori by blood, the world of Heian Japan was at last witnessing the birth of a Taira-descended emperor. Kiyomori's Taira were fast approaching the apex of their power, but simultaneously, storm clouds were also beginning to appear on their horizon. In 1169, retired Emperor Goshirakawa was involved in a spat with the wealthy and powerful Enryakuji Temple over alleged misconduct towards an important temple affiliate by a follower of one of Goshirakawa's close courtiers. Kiyomori would end up taking the side of Enryakuji in this situation, a decision which ultimately led to a peaceful resolution of the incident, but also sowed the first seeds of animosity between himself and the retired emperor. The following year was marked by another politically awkward episode involving the Taira, when a confrontation unexpectedly erupted between the followers of Kiyomori's grandson, the 13-year-old Skemori, and those of Emperor Takakura's Sesho regent, Fujiwara no Motofusa. The two had both been riding through Kyoto in their respective carriages when their routes intersected, and Motofusa's guards ended up roughing up Skemori and his entourage when the latter failed to disembark from his carriage as a show of respect to the former. Three months later, while Motofusa was on his way to the imperial palace for Emperor Takakura's coming-of-age ceremony, he found himself under attack by a large band of Taira-affiliated warriors, who dragged his guards from their horses and cut off their Motodori topknots, which were a symbol of their social status as adult men. Motofusa himself was not directly touched by any of the assailants, they still knew better than to actually lay hands on the imperial regent. But the incident was, understandably, met with a good deal of consternation and shock from the old guard aristocracy. Despite these unsettling events, the Tyra remained, overall, in a strong position heading into the 1170s. In 1171, Kiyomori successfully managed to have his daughter, Tokuko, wedded to Emperor Takakura as his empress consort and highest ranking wife a move which put Kiyomori in position to potentially become the maternal grandfather of a future emperor. This maternal grandfather position was what had allowed the northern house of the Fujiwara clan to establish de facto control over Japan's government in the 10th and 11th centuries, and the significance of this new development was thus undoubtedly not lost on Kiyomori's aristocratic peers. Things began, however, to take a worrying turn in 1176, when the imperial mother, Taira no Shigeko, took ill and passed away at the young age of 35. As Kiyomori's sister-in-law and the retired Emperor Goshirakawa's beloved wife, she had been a crucial player in keeping the two men on cordial terms, and her death quickly set them down the path to estrangement. The following year's Shishigatani incident would be the first outward symptom of this growing friction. The Shishigatani incident is named for the Shishi Valley on the eastern outskirts of ancient Kyoto, where a number of close associates of the retired emperor began meeting at a secluded villa to conspire against Kiyomori and the Taira. Scandalously, even Goshirakawa himself was present for some of the meetings, meaning that he was well aware of the plot and even giving it his tacit approval. 
In the tale of the Heike's portrayal of one of these meetings, the conspirators revel in making a series of bad puns about wine jars, based on the fact that in Japanese, the word meaning wine jar and the word referring to the Taira clan itself are homonyms, both being pronounced heishi. For example, one of the conspirators intentionally knocks over one of the jars and then jokes that the heishi have fallen. Sadly for the Shishigatani conspirators, their plot would never advance much beyond the witty dad joke stage, as one of their members eventually got cold feet and confessed the entire thing to Kiyomori. Despite his initial shock, the Taira Patriarch quickly sprang into action, arresting the conspirators, executing one of them, and sending the rest into exile far from the capital. He then presented Goshirakawa with a detailed written confession from one of the plotters to justify his actions, a confession which, naturally, included mention of Goshirakawa's own involvement in the conspiracy, thus making it subtly clear that this detail was no secret to Kiyomori. Right around this time, two large fires had shaken the people and infrastructure of Kyoto. These were 1177's Angen no Taika, or the Great Fire of the Angen Era, and 1178's Jisho no Taika, or the Great Fire of the Jisho Era. During the former, roughly a third of Kyoto burned to the ground, including 16 residences belonging to top-level aristocrats and a significant amount of the Daidairi Palace complex. Amongst the court buildings lost was the Daigokuden, which was used for holding events of national importance such as the imperial coronation ceremony. Although the Daigokuden had burned down twice in the past, its demise in the Angen fire would prove final as it would not be rebuilt, and its destruction led to difficulty in planning the coronation of new emperors. It is rumored that the timing of the Shishigatani conspiracy was influenced by the fires, with the plotters hoping that the chaos in Kyoto would make their movements less conspicuous, but this is just a theory. Shortly after the fires, in 1180, Kyoto experienced an extremely strong Tsumujikaze whirlwind. While mild whirlwinds in Kyoto are apparently not uncommon, one of this scale was unprecedented, and it stripped houses down to their framework along a roughly three-kilometer stretch. To the people of late Heian Japan, it must have almost seemed that nature itself was coming to reflect the era's ominous sense of political unease. At the end of 1178, Kiyomori's daughter, Tokuko, gave birth to the now 17-year-old Emperor Takakura's first son, and Kiyomori quickly had the boy designated as the emperor's official crown prince and heir. This triumph, however, was quickly followed by tragedy, as in the summer of the following year, Kiyomori's eldest son and heir, Taira no Shigemori, unexpectedly passed away at the age of 42. Shigemori's position as heir was based on more than just his age, as he was widely regarded as being Kiyomori's most gifted son and a man of good judgment and noble character. Shigemori's death had been preceded only a month before by the death of one of Kiyomori's daughters, and it was whispered throughout the imperial court that both tragedies had been the work of the evil spirits of Kiyomori's former political foes. The retired Emperor Goshirakawa, however, had little sympathy for the grieving Taira, and he took advantage of the opportunity to repossess a large amount of land which had been under the jurisdiction of the deceased siblings, almost as if to say, well, I guess you won't be needing this anymore. For the bereaved Kiyomori, this proved to be the final straw, and in this moment of combined sadness and rage, he at last seems to have decided that he was done with trying to play by the rules of his social betters. He mustered a force of several thousand warriors and led them into the capital, throwing the city into chaos, and over the course of the next two weeks, numerous high-ranking bureaucrats and provincial governors were relieved of their government posts and replaced with Taira loyalists. Kiyomori had a new Kampaku regent appointed, and he also forced retired Emperor Goshirakawa to officially promise that he would start taking his retired status literally and no longer involve himself whatsoever in the affairs of government. To ensure that this promise was kept, he then had the retired emperor escorted to his late father Toba's old residence just south of Kyoto, the Tobadono where, with just a bare-bones crew of courtiers and servants, he was placed under strict house arrest by Kiyomori's samurai. This entire incident is remembered as the Jisho Sannen no Seihen, or the coup d'etat of 1179, 
and it marked the beginning of a four-year period of dictatorial rule by Kiyomori's branch of the Taira. In the early months of the next year, Emperor Takakura abdicated the throne and his now one-and-a-half-year-old son was coronated as the new ruler of Japan under the name Emperor Antoku. With this coronation, Kiyomori at last ascended to the coveted status of maternal grandfather of the sitting emperor, and de facto rule of the country was all but his. While the young emperor Antoku might at a glance appear to have been nothing more than a tool for his grandfather to ascend to the heights of political power, in reality it seems that Kiyomori was every bit the doting grandfather. One account from a contemporary diary, the Sankaiki, records an episode in which Kiyomori delighted in playing with his toddler-aged grandson at his part-time residence in Kyoto. The tiny Antoku is said to have used a drool-covered finger to tear a small hole in the paper of a shoji screen in the home, and Kiyomori found this mischievous action so adorable that he ordered the screen moved into his warehouse to be preserved as something of a family treasure. Surrounded by political chaos and natural disaster, and living in constant uncertainty that the next family tragedy might be right around the corner, one can only imagine that these little moments of peace were all the more precious to Kiyomori and his kin. Sure enough, the young Antoku had hardly been on the throne more than a month before an incident occurred which set the currents of history roaring in a decidedly anti-Taira direction. The figure responsible for said incident is a man who has not yet appeared in our story, the Imperial Prince Mochisto. In the late spring of 1180, Mochisto, who was the third son of retired Emperor Goshirakawa, suddenly and unilaterally issued a princely order to the various bushi warriors of Japan, calling for the total destruction of the Taira. Now, Mochisto had several reasons to hate the Taira. In the past, Kiyomori had worked to prevent him from entering the line of succession in order to bring about the coronation of Emperor Takakura. During the coup d'etat of 1179, he had had a number of his land holdings confiscated by Kiyomori. And finally, the recent enthronement of little Emperor Antoku had made it quite clear that he no longer had any realistic hopes of ever making it to the imperial throne. At his wit's end, it seems that Prince Mochisto had finally snapped, and he had lashed out with the last bit of power that remained to him, the authority of his royal blood. The Taira finally moved to arrest the rebellious prince about a month after the issuing of his anti-Taira call to arms, but with no intention of peaceful surrender, he had already absconded from his Kyoto residence. In the hopes of having a fighting chance against the Taira, Mochisto called in a favor to the 76-year-old Minamoto no Yorimasa, a longtime imperial loyalist and the only member of the Seiwa Minamoto clan to have maintained his status in aristocratic society after the downfall of the clan two decades prior. Along with about 50 horsemen, the two attempted to make their way down to Nara to seek military aid from the temple of Kofukuji, but a force of some 300 Taira loyalists caught up with them as they were resting at the Byodoin temple. The ensuing battle, sometimes called the Battle of the Byodoin, marks the official beginning of the Genpei War. The Byodoin sits on the side of the Uji River opposite of Kyoto, and Mochisto's men had already partially dismantled the river's bridge to stymie any potential pursuers, meaning that the river became the primary obstacle around which the coming battle would revolve. The superhuman fighting of the three warrior monks Tajima, Meishu, and Ichirai Hoshi atop the stripped bridge frame is a famous fictional episode from this battle, with the first, Tajima, dodging and parrying a hail of Taira arrows, the second, Meishu, running barefoot along the beams of the bridge with perfect balance, and the third, Ichirai Hoshi, entering battle by somersaulting through the air over Meishu's head. Anyway, the Taira troops managed to cross the river by closely clustering their horses together so as to withstand the river's current, and once on the other side, they outnumbered and overwhelmed the Mochisto loyalists. The elderly Yorimasa opted to take his own life once defeat became imminent, and the ever-tenacious Prince Mochisto attempted to flee and live to fight another day, but was ultimately killed by an arrow from his pursuers. 
Mochisto's fight had ended, but his actions had sparked a rebellion that would live on far past his own death, as his anti taira call to arms was already being transmitted far and wide throughout the provinces. It should be a clear foreshadowing of events to come that the Azuma Kagami, the late 13th, early 14th century history of the Kamakura Shogunate, begins its tale with the issuing of Mochisto's order. Just a few weeks after Mochisto's death, in reaction to the growing anti taira atmosphere in and around Kyoto, Taira no Kiyomori made a shocking decision. Japan's capital, and thus the permanent residences of the emperor and retired emperors, would be relocated to his home base of Fukuhara. This decision came completely out of the blue for the people of Kyoto, and caused a significant amount of unrest, especially considering that the city had been operating as Japan's capital for nearly four centuries. However, the emperor and all the high-level bureaucrats were now heading to Fukuhara, so anyone wishing to advance in the political or social world had little choice but to do the same. Many houses were deconstructed and rafted down the Yodo River, and Kyoto became like a ghost town. Unfortunately, Fukuhara was a far cry from Kyoto in both its elegance and its functionality as a capital. While its being on the coast of the Seto Inland Sea put it in an advantageous place commercially and militarily, for the Taira, it was much smaller than the old capital, and the fact that it was surrounded by mountains on its non-coastal sides meant that its possibility for expansion was rather limited. When the contemporary writer and poet Kamo no Chome visited the new capital, he remarked that buildings were sparse, everyone was classlessly dressed like a warrior or a peasant, and there was a general atmosphere of worry and unease. Kiyomori's resolve was as strong as ever, but it was becoming less and less clear to what degree society would be able, or willing for that matter, to keep up with him. Minamoto no Yoritomo in late April of 1180, just over a month before the capital transfer to Fukuhara, Prince Mochisto's order for the destruction of the Taira reached the Yakata residence of one Hojo Tokimasa, a powerful bushi warrior and landholder of Izu province in the eastern Kanto region. The Hojo trace their lineage back to the Kamu Taira, making them distant relatives of Taira no Kiyomori's branch of said clan, and for two decades now, Tokimasa had been entrusted with the supervision of Minamoto no Yoritomo, the exiled heir to the main line of the Seiwa Minamoto clan. As we briefly noted at the start of this video, Yoritomo's father and two elder brothers had perished at the close of a small civil war called the Heiji Disturbance in 1160. Yoritomo himself was in his early teens at the time, making him easily old enough to be treated as an adult and thus executed as such, but thanks to an earnest plea from Taira no Kiyomori's stepmother of all people, his life was spared. The traditional narrative holds that Kiyomori's stepmother was moved by Yoritomo's striking resemblance to one of her own sons who had tragically died young a decade or so earlier. And while this may be no more than a legend, it remains a touching anecdote even nearly a millennium later. Either way, Yoritomo was shipped off to Izu province with only the tiniest handful of followers, and it was likely hoped that, under the supervision of the Hojo, he would live out the rest of his years there quietly and unambitiously. Ironically, however, this exile gave the capital-raised Yoritomo the chance to return to his roots in a way, and become acquainted with the wild eastern backcountry in which Japan's warrior culture had been born and Yoritomo's own ancestors had made their name. Over the course of his 20-year exile, Yoritomo also became extremely close with his Hojo overseers, even marrying Tokimasa's daughter, the fiery Hojo Masako who allegedly ran away from home and threatened to never return in order to force her reluctant father into permitting the union. Yoritomo was residing in the Hojo residence when the news of Prince Mochisto's call to arms was delivered, and at first he was not particularly eager to react to it. However, when an aristocratic contact of his in the capital informed him that, as a potential threat to the Taira, his life was now likely in danger, he at last made the difficult decision to raise the flag of rebellion. Perhaps influenced by their in-law relationship, or perhaps simply judging that the winds of change were blowing against the Taira, 
Hojo Tokimasa also decided to discard his overseer duties and gamble on Yoritomo's cause. Yoritomo officially sprang into action in August, sending warriors under Tokimasa to attack the residence of one Yamaki Kanetaka, the Taira-aligned de facto governor of Izu province. The battle did not go smoothly, but Tokimasa managed to take the residence and kill Kanetaka, and this victory gave Yoritomo some initial momentum that would begin to attract Kanto warriors to his cause. Yoritomo, Tokimasa, and their allies then began to make for Sagami province to the north, in the hopes of linking up with the Miura clan, who had old ties with Yoritomo's late father and possessed a substantial navy. By August 23rd, Yoritomo and his small army of several hundred men had made camp on Mount Ishibashi in the Hakone Mountains. They were waiting for the Miura army to rendezvous with them there, but heavy rain had led to flooding that was delaying their allies' arrival. Meanwhile, the Taira vassal Oba Kagechika had assembled an army of roughly 3,000 at the base of the mountain, and Ito Skechika, another Taira ally, was also converging on the area in the hopes that the two of them could catch Yoritomo in a pincer attack. However, when Kagechika received word that the Miura army was drawing near, he feared the possibility of his own force being caught in a similar maneuver, and thus opted to move immediately, initiating a full assault on Yoritomo's camp and kicking off the battle of Mount Ishibashi. The two armies met on the mountain slope in the dead of night, with a heavy rain falling and the light of the moon obscured by the surrounding mountains. The fighting lasted all through the night, but by morning, Yoritomo's defeat was clear, and he began to retreat, all the while being pursued by enemy warriors and forced even deeper into the mountains. By this time, he had lost contact with many of his allies, including Hojo Tokimasa, and he is said to have spent the following night hiding in a mountain cave with the small handful of warriors who had managed to stick with him through the chaos. They were discovered there by the Taira ally Kajiwara Kagetoki, who, for whatever reason, chose not to report them to his comrades. Kagetoki would later become a key vassal of Yoritomo, and it seems that even at this early stage, he already harbored some secret sympathy for the Minamoto cause. Yoritomo made it out of the Hakone Mountains with his handful of allies and reached the Manazuru Cape in southern Sagami, sailing east from there to Awa province, where he reunited with Tokimasa and at last joined forces with the Miura. From here, he managed to obtain the loyalty of the powerful Kazusa and Chiba clans, both of which had old ties to Yoritomo's late father. It should be noted, however, that the quote-unquote samurai loyalty that we like to romanticize today was far from the norm in this era, and a clan's former service to the Minamoto was by no means a guarantee that Yoritomo could count on their aid. Indeed, the aforementioned Oba Kagechika, who had led the army that crushed Yoritomo at Mount Ishibashi, was a warrior who had once fought under Yoritomo's father in the Hogen Disturbance of 1156. Those clans who allied themselves with Yoritomo in the early days of the Genpei War mostly had their own calculated pragmatic reasons for doing so, and old bonds of fealty simply offered a convenient pretext for all parties involved. Either way, with the combined might of the Miura, the Kazusa, and the Chiba behind him, Yoritomo's days of hiding in muddy mountain caves were firmly a thing of the past, and more and more warriors began to opportunistically flock to his banner. He marched his army up the Boso Peninsula and around Edo Bay, occupying several provincial headquarters and recruiting a slew of new allies before at last making his way back to Sagami province. There, in early October, he converged on the Kamakura district, a sleepy coastal region with deep historical ties to his family. Yoritomo chose to set up his permanent base here in a spot which was a natural stronghold, flanked on three sides by mountains and looking out onto Sagami Bay, and he began by ordering the construction of a large residence and sending for his wife Masako to come join him from Izu. Yoritomo's establishment of his base here would mark the official foundation of what would eventually grow into the medieval city of Kamakura. By this point, Yoritomo's rebellion had grown to a large enough scale that it had reached the attention of Taira no Kiyomori in Kyoto, and the latter had already begun assembling an army to march east and hopefully nip the whole uprising in the bud. Command of the Taira army had been entrusted to Kiyomori's 21-year-old grandson, Koremori, 
who had begun marching what was apparently a large but only tenuously united force toward Kanto in late September. Hearing the news of the Taira army's approach, Yoritomo set out from Kamakura with an army that had allegedly swollen to anywhere from 50 to more than 200,000 men, and he made camp near the Fuji River in Suruga province. There, he was joined by another sizable army led by the Takeda clan of Kai province, an offshoot branch of the Seiwa Minamoto who had risen up against the Taira independently of Yoritomo. The Taira army made camp on the western side of the Fuji River, but their morale was by this point extremely low. Their leader, Koremori, was inexperienced, their rations were sparse due to famine in the west, and they were shaken by the news that the Takeda forces had already defeated the Taira allied deputy governor of Suruga, not to mention by the sheer size of Yoritomo's army. Deserters were increasing day by day, to the point that the Taira force is said to have shrunk to only 2,000 men, less than a tenth of its original size. With all these factors in place, disquiet had reached a fever pitch, and during the middle of the night, on the same day that they had made camp, the Taira army began a sudden retreat, ending what is remembered as the Battle of the Fuji River, without a single arrow even being fired. Legend holds that the Taira retreat was sparked by the sudden takeoff of a flock of birds, which the Taira warriors, who were all nervous wrecks by this point, mistook for the sound of an enemy charge. They are said to have fled in absolute disarray, with warriors hopping onto whatever horse was nearest at hand, regardless of its actual owner, and arms and armor being left scattered and forgotten in their wake. The veracity of this anecdote is highly questionable, but it certainly makes clear the perception of the Taira by later generations as a once great bushy warrior clan made soft by too many years hobnobbing with aristocrats in the capital. Yoritomo initially expressed a desire to pursue the fleeing Taira back to Kyoto in the hopes of crushing his foes in one fell swoop and making a glorious homecoming to the city he had been exiled from 20 years prior. However, the leaders of the Miura, Chiba, and Kazusa clans, in other words, the men contributing the majority of Yoritomo's military strength, opposed this, suggesting instead that Yoritomo turn back east and work on dealing with the remaining powerful Kanto families who had yet to bend the knee to him. We must remember that Yoritomo's supporters were not in this only to bring about some idealized revival of the Minamoto clan's glory, and that many of them were also interested in taking advantage of Yoritomo's cause to stabilize their own provincial bases of power. Yoritomo would ultimately choose to heed his supporters' advice and focus his attention on the Kanto region, a decision which would prove historic in setting the course both for the rest of his own life and for the shogunal government which he would eventually establish. With the decision not to immediately march on Kyoto having been made, Yoritomo pulled back to the provincial headquarters of Sagami province, where he carried out his first large-scale reward ceremony officially guaranteeing the hereditary land holdings of his followers and awarding new lands to those who had distinguished themselves in his service. Roughly two months later, he would hold a ceremony in Kamakura at his newly built residence in which 311 of his most esteemed followers had their names officially recorded as his vassals. The warriors fighting under Yoritomo may have all had their own goals and ulterior motives, but they were slowly but surely finding themselves bound ever deeper into the service of the new lord of Kamakura. Back in Fukuhara, Taira no Kiyomori was furious at the news of his army's embarrassing defeat at the Fuji River, but this was only one of many problems for him. Anti-Taira forces were rising up all over Japan, and rebellion was breaking out even out west in areas that had traditionally been bastions of power for the Taira clan. With the situation as bad as it was, Kiyomori was begrudgingly forced to order that Kyoto be reinstated as the country's capital, and the seat of government returned there ASAP. He simply had too much on his plate to be worrying about designing city infrastructure. Once back in Kyoto, Kiyomori quickly got to work striking back at his clan's enemies, sending his warriors to Omi province in December to defeat a Minamoto faction there and raise their base, the Temple of Onjoji. Later that same month, he sent forces under his son Shigehira to move against two of the great temples of Nara, Kohukuji and Todaiji, 
bastions of semi-independent power which had been consistently demonstrating a defiant attitude toward the Tyra. Beyond just defeating the warrior monks of these temples in battle, the Tyra forces then set fire to both temple complexes, creating a massive conflagration which resulted in the destruction of the Great Buddha Hall of Todaiji and the death by fire of some 2,500 people. According to the tale of the Heike, the attack was never intended to go this far and had simply spiraled out of control in the heat of the moment but contemporary aristocratic diaries indicate that it was probably a very much premeditated affair. Either way, the incident cemented Kiyomori's reputation with the public as a butteki, an enemy of the Buddha, and a man for whom divine retribution almost certainly awaited. The people of Japan would not have to wait long to see Kiyomori pay the price of his alleged sins. In January of the new year, Kiyomori's son-in-law, the retired emperor Takakura, died of illness at the young age of only 21, his health having been in a deteriorating state throughout the past year. Kiyomori spent the next month or so dealing with the political ramifications of Takakura's death, while also trying to juggle the problem of the rebellion that was breaking out against him all throughout the country. In regard to the former, Kiyomori had the late Takakura's father, the wily old retired emperor Goshirakawa, reinstated as the central pillar of aristocratic society but he also married one of his younger daughters to the ex-sovereign as a literal ball and chain connecting Goshirakawa to the Taira. In regard to the latter, Kiyomori appointed his son Munemori to an old military position established way back in the Nara period that would give him the authority to raise troops and collect food supplies across a whopping nine provinces in central Japan. Kiyomori's leadership was as active and confident as ever showing no signs of faltering in the face of the ever-deepening chaos that was engulfing the country. But in late February, it seems that his body had finally had enough. His symptoms began with a headache, but soon developed into a raging fever which, according to legend, soon rose to inhuman levels of heat. One contemporary account records that it was as if Kiyomori's body was literally on fire with servants pouring water over him and placing heaps of snow on his head, only for those things to instantly evaporate into clouds of steam. The author of this account, the Yowagan Ninki, then goes on to attribute Kiyomori's suffering to his crimes against Japan's great temples, and it should come as little surprise that said author is thought to have been a monk of one of those temples, throwing a good deal of doubt over this fantastical account. Modern scholars have suggested that Kiyomori's ailment may have been meningitis. Whatever the case, on March 27th of the Gregorian calendar, the 64-year-old Taira no Kiyomori, the immovable rock who had anchored the Taira clan through nearly three decades of both prosperity and hardship, drew his final breath. On his final morning, he had sent a messenger to retired Emperor Goshirakawa, requesting that, after his death, all affairs of state be conducted in consultation with his son and heir Munemori, but ominously he did not receive a clear reply. Some accounts hold that on the evening of Kiyomori's funeral, the sounds of a riotous party at the retired emperor's residence could be heard echoing into the Kyoto night. Kiyomori was succeeded as leader of the Taira by the aforementioned Munemori, who struggled to pull together a family that was becoming divided between those who wished to sue for peace with the Minamoto and those, including himself, who wished to continue the fight. Munemori used the military authority invested in him by his late father to implement harsh wartime policies across the parts of the country still under Taira influence, carrying out invasive surveys of people and supplies and even seizing homes in the capital for use in stationing his troops. Just a few weeks after Kiyomori's death, the large Taira army defeated a prominent Minamoto relative at the Sunomata River near the border of Owari Province and Mino Province, gaining them some much needed momentum. However, as soon as they returned to Kyoto, the area once again began to fall into a state of rebellion. Right around this time, a severe famine known as the Yowa Famine was beginning and it would continue into the following year. Both drought in the spring and summer and flooding in the fall and winter were occurring and the year's harvest was particularly bad. The poor health and hygiene brought on by starvation in turn led to plague, 
some farmers began to abandon their fields, reducing crop yields even further, and the fighting in the provinces was also slowing the transport of goods to Kyoto. Since the city relied entirely on other areas for its food supply, it was quickly falling into a state of non-functionality as a capital. Robbery and robbery-motivated arson were becoming major problems, and people in all strata of society were dying of hunger and disease, with reports even circulating of some starving citizens beginning to cannibalize their dead. These problems were only compounded by the Taira's insistence on maintaining their huge standing army, in large part out of fear that if they let their soldiers go, they might never be able to assemble them again. As the Taira-held capital slowly began to resemble hell on earth, Minamoto no Yoritomo coolly looked on from his headquarters in Kamakura, content to watch his foes essentially besiege themselves. In the late summer of 1181, Yoritomo at last sent a message discreetly to retired Emperor Goshirakawa, informing him that he and his associates were loyal subjects of the imperial court, who had risen up in arms only to protect the imperial family from its enemies. Moreover, he stated that he would be happy to work together with the Taira, as his family had in times past, to return the country to a state of peace. Whatever his true intentions, Yoritomo's cool-headed and submissive stance here left an extremely positive impression on the retired emperor and the Kyoto aristocracy, and the tyrannical, overbearing Taira began to look less and less attractive in comparison. The retired emperor passed on Yoritomo's suggestion of Taira Minamoto cooperation to Munemori, who flatly refused to entertain such an idea. Yoritomo was a criminal and a rebel, and there would be no peace or cooperation with him and his ilk. One cannot help but wonder if the situation hadn't played out exactly as Yoritomo had planned. Kiso Yoshinaka Minamoto no Yoritomo was the most high-profile person to respond to the late Prince Mochisto's order to destroy the Taira, but he was hardly the only one. Just a month after Yoritomo himself had begun to raise troops in 1180, another important member of the Seiwa Minamoto clan had independently begun to do the same, Minamoto no Yoshinaka, better known to his contemporaries as Kiso Yoshinaka. Yoshinaka was Yoritomo's cousin, but there was little in the way of family bonds between the two men. Their fathers had been involved in a power struggle back in the 1150s, and Yoshinaka's father had ultimately been attacked and killed by Yoritomo's legendary older brother, Yoshihira. Yoshinaka, who was a baby at this time, barely escaped death himself and was spirited off to the Kiso Valley in Shinano province to be raised by the husband of his wet nurse. It was from his upbringing in the Kiso Valley that Yoshinaka came to be referred to as Kiso Yoshinaka, and while he seems to have grown up to love his foster family as fiercely as any, he never forgot about the blood relatives of his who were responsible for his father's premature demise. After receiving Mochisto's princely order, Yoshinaka called the warriors of Shinano to his banner and began to move against Taira sympathizers. His first move was to defeat the Taira vassal Ogasawara Yorinao, a victory which allowed him to move into his father's old territory of Kozuke province, where he was enthusiastically greeted by many of his father's old vassals. Kozuke, however, being the westernmost province of the Kanto region, was already part of Minamoto no Yoritomo's sphere of influence, and Yoshinaka opted to return to Shinano so as to avoid any fruitless conflicts with his estranged cousin. Instead, he chose to advance next into Echigo province, where he defeated the Zhou clan, a branch family of the Taira whose antagonistic presence there was threatening him from behind and preventing him from being able to advance towards central Japan. After dealing with the Zhou clan, Yoshinaka sent his ten-year-old son to Yoritomo in Kamakura as a hostage and a gesture of goodwill, and with this, he at last seems to have felt secure enough to begin taking his local war to a national level. The ball really began to get rolling in March of 1183, after the Yowa famine had finally begun to let up, when the Taira dispatched their massive main army up towards the Hokurikudo region, basically the western side of northern Honshu. 
To prepare for this mobilization, the Tyra had coercively pulled a large number of men and supplies from the various provinces of western Japan, with records even indicating that they conscripted a good deal of non-warrior peasants such as lumber workers. As a result, their allegedly 100,000 strong army was a huge but fragile construction, hated by the local populace wherever they went thanks to their need to plunder local villages and temples for provisions. Even despite this, they initially experienced great success in their campaign, winning a number of small battles and capturing several fortifications held by anti-Taira forces aligned with Kiso Yoshinaka. The tides at last began to turn when the Taira army attempted to traverse the Kurikara mountain pass at the border of Kaga province and Echu province. There, Yoshinaka quietly converged on their position with his own large army encircling them and launching an attack from several directions in the dead of night. Legend holds that he also employed a strategy called the Kagyu no Ke, in which he tied torches to the horns of cattle and then sicked them on the Taira to cause even further chaos. Caught completely off guard, the Taira soldiers began a panicked retreat, but the area's unforgiving geography meant that even many of those who escaped the arrows of Yoshinaka's warriors still ended up falling to their deaths from the Kurikara Pass's steep cliffs. Yoshinaka pursued the demoralized and fleeing Taira into Kaga province, where he attacked and defeated them once again, doing enough damage that the Taira army that eventually made it back to Kyoto was only about a fifth of its original size. Yoshinaka continued to advance down the Hokurikudo, securing alliances with various local Minamoto branch families and eventually making it down to Omi province just a hop and a skip away from Kyoto itself. By this point, the citizens of the capital had begun to eagerly await Yoshinaka as a righteous liberator, and even the powerful temple of Enryakuji had publicly expressed its support for him. Realizing that their hold on the city was no longer tenable, the Taira gathered up the young Emperor Antoku and the three imperial treasures, burned their residences in the Rokuhara neighborhood, and set out west to recuperate and prepare for a counterattack at some point down the line. The Taira had at last abandoned Kyoto. They had also intended to bring the imperial patriarch, Goshirakawa, along with them, but as usual, the retired emperor was marching to his own tune, and he had already fled to Mount Hiei to avoid being swept up in the Taira plan. On July 28, 1183, Yoshinaka and 50,000 of his men made a triumphant entry into the capital, where they were enthusiastically greeted by the citizenry and aristocracy. Retired Emperor Goshirakawa himself was also eager to welcome Kyoto's new saviors, and he was quick to show that any affection he may have once had for the Taira, if indeed he ever had any at all, was now firmly a thing of the past. He issued Yoshinaka an imperial decree ordering him to pursue and destroy the fleeing Taira clan, an act which officially established the new political narrative for the country. The Minamoto warriors who had risen up in rebellion were now the official defenders of the country and the imperial court, while the once proud Taira were now nothing more than traitors and outlaws. Along with this official recognition, Yoshinaka was greatly rewarded with lands and titles by Goshirakawa and the aristocracy, and for a moment it almost seemed as though the exiled orphan had finally made it, if you will. However, the truth is that ultimate glory was never really in the cards for Yoshinaka. When the top ministers of the imperial court had met to decide how rewards ought to be doled out to the liberators of the capital, Yoshinaka, the man who had actually led the army that physically drove the Taira out of Kyoto, was designated as the number two hero of the incident, the second most valuable player in other words. The man recognized as the number one contributor to the Taira clan's expulsion was Yoshinaka's cousin, and the man who still had yet to take a single step outside of his headquarters at Kamakura, Minamoto no Yoritomo. At the end of the day, it was Yoritomo who was heir to the main line of the Seiwa Minamoto, a fact which made him both well-known and highly esteemed in the eyes of the Kyoto aristocracy. Moreover, as we saw earlier, Yoritomo had already been corresponding with the imperial court for some time and using skilled diplomatic tactics to present himself as a humble and respectful servant of the ruling class. In contrast, Yoshinaka was just a branch Minamoto family member with little to no reputation in the capital, who had appeared out of nowhere at the head of a large army. 
Making things worse was the fact that said army had not been behaving very well since its arrival in Kyoto, with many of its members engaging in wanton theft and violence in order to feed themselves. On top of this, a sizable chunk of the army began to return east of their own accord in the following months, further illustrating the fact that Yoshinaka's army really was just a loose coalition of provincial freedom fighters rather than an organized, disciplined fighting force loyal to their commander. The imperial court appreciated Yoshinaka's having driven the Taira out of Kyoto, but it was Yoritomo whom they really wanted to see taking charge of the situation. Yoshinaka further damaged his reputation with the imperial court by attempting to go way above his pay grade and intervene in the issue of imperial succession, as the court was at the time attempting to replace the absent Taira-backed Emperor Antoku. They would ultimately decide on Antoku's younger half-brother from a Fujiwara mother, not Yoshinaka's choice, by the way. But the fact that Yoshinaka had even dared to offer his opinion on the issue was shocking and offensive in the eyes of aristocratic society. Retired Emperor Goshirakawa at last decided that it was time to get Yoshinaka out of the capital, and in late 1183, he sent him out west to engage the Taira army in Bichu province. The ensuing clash, known as the Battle of Mizushima, was a coastal battle which played to the sea-loving Taira clan's strengths, and Yoshinaka's army was badly defeated, inadvertently giving the Taira a much-needed momentum boost. While Yoshinaka was out taking a beating in the west, Koshirakawa was frantically engaging in correspondence with Yoritomo in Kamakura, begging him to come to the capital. Koshirakawa began by reinstating Yoritomo's court rank which he had been stripped of way back when he was exiled as a young teenager, but this alone would not be enough to budge the Minamoto chieftain. What finally clinched the deal was Goshirakawa's issuing, at Yoritomo's suggestion, of an imperial decree remembered as the October Decree of Jue Year 2. This decree ordered that control of all land in the Tokaido and Tosando regions of Japan be returned to their rightful owners, and that in this process Yoritomo would be given complete authority to deal with anyone who didn't comply with this order. It may not be immediately apparent from this wording, but what the order meant in a nutshell is that Goshirakawa had effectively conceded control of eastern Japan to Yoritomo, and many scholars mark the issuing of the October Decree as the real birth of the Kamakura Shogunate. The defeated Yoshinaka returned to Kyoto shortly after the issuing of the October Decree, and he expressed his strong displeasure to the retired emperor about the political decisions that had been made in his absence. Amidst rumors that Yoritomo's warriors were already scouting out the provinces around the capital, friction between Yoshinaka and Goshirakawa finally reached a peak, and a desperate Yoshinaka wound up attacking Goshirakawa's residence and placing the retired emperor under house arrest. In the weeks that followed, Yoshinaka conducted himself almost as if he were the second coming of Taira no Kiyomori, ruling Kyoto as an iron-fisted dictator and eventually even appointing himself to the position of shogun. However, by late January of 1184, two large armies under the respective commands of Yoritomo's two younger half-brothers, Minamoto no Yoshitsune and Minamoto no Noriyori, had reached the capital to liberate it from their mentally unraveling cousin. By this point, food shortage and loss of popularity had resulted in Yoshinaka's once massive army being reduced to just a few hundred, and he was numerically no match for the fresh Kamakura forces. Yoshinaka attempted to halt his enemy's advance at the Uji and Seta rivers, destroying bridges and booby-trapping shallow regions with nails and nets, but it was only a matter of time before both defensive points were breached and Yoshinaka's waiting forces were overwhelmed by their foes. Yoshinaka himself met his end at Awazu on the shore of Lake Biwa, having fought his way there from Kyoto with a tiny cohort of his most loyal followers. Among these followers is said to have been his childhood friend and lover, Tomoe Gozen, one of the most famous female warriors in Japanese history. According to legend, Yoshinaka convinced Tomoe to flee the battlefield, and then, as the warriors of Kamakura closed in, he began searching for a place to honorably end his own life. Unfortunately, as he was searching, he accidentally got his horse's legs stuck in an unexpectedly deep rice paddy, and as he struggled to extricate himself, he was struck and killed by an enemy arrow, 
an ignominious end for a proud warrior who perhaps flew just a little too close to the sun. After Yoshinaka's defeat, the Kamakura army entered the city of Kyoto, and as a contemporary aristocratic diary records, they did not engage in a single bit of vandalism or otherwise unbecoming behavior. Yoritomo seems to have known more than anyone else of his era that the road to power was paved with good impressions. Almost immediately, he received an imperial decree ordering him to do what Yoshinaka had failed to, destroy the Taira once and for all. Minamoto no Yoshitsune The Kamakura Minamoto army was, as mentioned previously, led by Yoritomo's two younger half-brothers, Minamoto no Noriyori and Minamoto no Yoshitsune. Both men shared the same father with Yoritomo, but their mothers were different women of lower rank, making themselves both also lower-ranking members of the Minamoto clan. Bastards in a sense, although the concept does not translate exactly. In the case of the latter, Yoshitsune, his mother was a lady-in-waiting to one of Emperor Konoe's wives, and he was only an infant when his father perished in 1159's Heiji Disturbance. According to legend, his mother saved him from execution at the hands of the Taira by offering herself up as a concubine to Taira no Kiyomori, who was swayed into accepting the deal on account of her unparalleled beauty. Around the age of seven, Yoshitsune was sent off to Kurama Temple, north of Kyoto, where he was to be raised to become a Buddhist priest, the only avenue of existence which Taira no Kiyomori was willing to permit for him. However, shortly before he was to officially enter the priesthood as a teenager, he supposedly learned of his true identity as the son of Minamoto no Yoshitomo, and he fled Kurama Temple for Japan's wild northeastern frontier, the Tohoku region, known as Oshu during this era. He took refuge in Tohoku as a guest of Fujiwara no Hidehira, head of the Oshu Fujiwara family, which had been governing the north since the end of the later Three Years' War nearly 100 years previously. The Oshu Fujiwara were practically like an independent dynasty in this era, sending generous and regular tributes of horses and gold to the emperor in Kyoto, but otherwise being allowed to maintain hereditary rule over their territory. Yoshitsune stayed with the Oshu Fujiwara in their regional capital of Hiraizumi for the next six years or so, although at some point during this period he is said to have temporarily made his way back to Kyoto, where he defeated the rogue warrior monk Benkei and won his allegiance as a loyal follower. The truth of Benkei's actual historical existence is highly dubious, but he is nevertheless one of the most famous and beloved figures in Japanese history, and a name that is difficult to leave out of any discussion of Minamoto no Yoshitsune. Either way, it seems that the young Yoshitsune, being a sort of outcast misfit of the Heian warrior world, may have been finding his own ways to slowly put together a small but loyal band of ragtag followers. In 1180, when Yoshitsune heard that his older half-brother Yoritomo had risen up against the Taira in response to Prince Mochihito's decree, he made his goodbyes to Fujiwara no Hidehira and headed south in the hopes of joining Yoritomo's cause. He is said to have reached Yoritomo's camp the day after the great Minamoto victory at the Battle of the Fuji River, tearfully greeting his older sibling for the first time and officially entering into his service. For the next few years, Yoshitsune would reside in Kamakura, apparently living in a room within Yoritomo's residence and building up strong enough brotherly bonds to be entrusted with the command of troops during the campaign against Kiso Yoshinaka in late 1183 and early 1184. While Yoshitsune, his older half-brother Noriyori, and the warriors of Kamakura had been busy putting an end to Yoshinaka's brief reign of terror in the capital, the Taira had been quietly preparing to attempt their long-awaited comeback. You will recall that shortly before his demise at the hands of the Kamakura army, Yoshinaka had also suffered a loss to the Taira in Bichu province, and the Taira had used the momentum from their victory there to begin making a push back east. By the beginning of 1184, the Taira had re-entered their late patriarch Kiyomori's old base of Fukuhara, and they began fortifying their position there in the hopes of using it as a launching pad to eventually retake the capital. At the beginning of February, with less than two months having passed since their victory against Yoshinaka, Yoshitsune and Noriyori set out for Fukuhara to engage the Taira. 
Once again, they divided their force in two, with Noriyori approaching the Taira position frontally from the east, and Yoshitsune swinging around to attack their rear from the west. After winning a skirmish at Mount Mikusa north of the main Taira position, Yoshitsune further divided his force, ordering the main contingent to advance as planned to attack the Taira from the west, while he and a small strike force would move directly through the mountains to hit the enemy unexpectedly from the north. They supposedly proceeded through this treacherous mountain route under the guidance of a local hunter and his son, who guided them along a little-known path used by wild deer. On the morning of the 6th, Noriyori's forces engaged the Taira to the east of Fukuhara at a place called Ikuta, while Yoshitsune's main force engaged them to the west of Fukuhara at their fortification at Ichinotani, all according to plan. The battle was apparently an evenly matched affair until Yoshitsune's strike force emerged out of the mountains to the north of Ichinotani, galloping down the steep cliffside to throw the unprepared Taira army into total chaos. Before long, the Taira forces had been completely routed, and they began running for their nearby ships anchored along the coast, abandoning Hukuhara and fleeing seaward. In this battle, remembered afterwards as the Battle of Ichinotani, the Taira are said to have lost around a thousand horsemen, as well as nearly a dozen prominent members of their own family, with perhaps the most famous casualty being one Taira no Atsumori. The young Atsumori was only 17 and renowned for his looks and his musical skill. According to legend, Atsumori was running for the ships along with his fellow warriors during the Taira retreat, but he was stopped in his tracks by the Minamoto samurai Kumagai Naozane, who, not knowing who he was, called out to him from behind that showing his back to an enemy was a cowardly move. Atsumori took the bait and turned to face Naozane, engaging him in single combat but ultimately being defeated by the older warrior. Naozane ripped off Atsumori's helmet in order to behead the boy, but he hesitated upon seeing his foe's face and realizing that he was hardly any older than his own teenage son. Judging from his wealthy appearance that Atsumori was likely a very high-ranking person, Naozane asked him to tell him his name, but Atsumori defiantly told him to take my head and ask someone. They'll know who I am. Tearfully and reluctantly, Naozane obliged him. Yoshitsune's sneak attack is typically cited as the main reason for the crushing Minamoto victory at the Battle of Ichinotani. But other sources also suggest that the Taira may have been just generally unprepared for battle thanks to misleading correspondence from retired Emperor Goshirakawa, which suggested the possibility of a peace deal. Considering that Goshirakawa was always a bit of a shifty operator, this story certainly has a strong air of believability. Almost exactly a year of uneasy peace would pass before the war's next big military clash, but both sides remained busy on the home front. The Taira set up their major bases of operation at Yashima in Sanuki province on the island of Shikoku and Hikoshima in Nagato province on the southern tip of Honshu. They continued to control the inland sea as well as the trade and transportation being carried out there and their maritime supremacy was one of the main factors keeping them afloat in the fight against the Minamoto. In the political realm, the first signs of tension between Yoritomo and Yoshitsune had begun to appear, with the latter accepting appointment to a pair of prestigious courtly military positions from retired Emperor Goshirakawa without first requesting the permission of the former. Part of Yoritomo's success thus far in the war, and something which set him apart from his Taira foes, had been his ability to maintain a strict lord-vassal relationship with his followers, and for this reason he very much did not appreciate one of his vassals, half-brother or not, accepting promotions from another master. In August, Yoritomo ordered Noriyori to march west with the goal of winning over Kyushu and essentially trapping the Taira in an east-west pincer. Noriyori's army for this campaign only included about a thousand Kanto samurai, and he seems to have greatly relied on warriors from the central regions around Kyoto, as well as local warriors from the western provinces who had formerly been vassals of the Taira. Yoritomo cautioned Noriyori to take the utmost care not to anger or upset any of these new allies, but nevertheless things did not go smoothly and food shortages and the lack of a strong navy eventually brought Noriyori's campaign to a standstill in southern Honshu. It was at this point that the order came to Yoshitsune in Kyoto to do something to break the stalemate, 
And so, sometime around February 18, 1185, the young Minamoto general crossed over to Awa province in Shikoku with the goal of attacking the Taira base at Yashima. The original plan had been to make the crossing with a full-size army, but stormy weather had made this plan unfeasible, and Yoshitsune instead crossed over with only about 150 men. After making landfall in Awa, Yoshitsune's small band made their way northwest by cover of darkness, arriving at the village of Takamatsu just south of Yashima on the following morning. They then set fire to the homes nearby, and with the massive blaze behind them masking their numbers, they crossed the shallows to Yashima and began their assault, kicking off what is remembered to history as the Battle of Yashima. The Taira, expecting a sea attack, were once again caught off guard by Yoshitsune's tactics, and tricked into thinking they were being sneak attacked by a large army, began fleeing to their ships, giving Yoshitsune time to set fire to much of their base. However, upon finally noticing their enemies' surprisingly scarce numbers, some of the Taira warriors began returning, and battle was at last joined at the water's edge. This battle was the scene of many famous legendary episodes, such as Yoshitsune nearly losing his bow and then risking life and limb to retrieve it, and the Minamoto warrior Nasuno Yoichi demonstrating his expert marksmanship by shooting a folding fan held aloft on a distant Taira ship. The battle ultimately devolved into a stalemate, which lasted for the next two days, with the Taira finally abandoning Yashima after unsuccessfully attempting to sneak attack Yoshitsune's position from the rear and being repelled. With the victory at Yashima, many of the heretofore neutral warriors of the Seto Inland Sea area began to side with the Minamoto, and the construction of a genuine, formidable navy which could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Taira at last became possible. Not only that, but the other main wing of the Minamoto army, the one under Noriyori's command, had finally succeeded in crossing over to and capturing northern Kyushu, crushing any possibility for the Taira of retreating further west. They were going to have to make a last stand, and on March 24th, 1185, that last stand would take place at Danoura Bay in the Shimonoseki Strait between Honshu and Kyushu. Danoura Bay was a stone's throw away from the Taira clan's final stronghold of Hikoshima, and it was here that the Taira chose to meet the approaching Minamoto navy, which had by now swelled large enough to outnumber the Taira significantly. The Minamoto were led by none other than our young hero Yoshitsune, still hot off his upset victory at Yashima, although he would also be supported from the coast by Noriyori's land troops. Despite the Minamoto's numerical advantage, they would still have to contend with the inherent difficulty of their maritime battlefield, whose current fluctuated from east to west throughout the day and was known to reach a speed of up to 15 kilometers per hour. At the beginning of the battle, the current was flowing east, giving an advantage to the Taira, who were on the western side and thus didn't need to fight the current to advance. Yoshitsune's fleet was being pressed hard, and sensing the possibility of defeat, Yoshitsune gave the order to his men to begin firing their arrows at the Taira boatmen and rowers. This was something of a faux pas by the customary rules of war for the era, which frowned upon the killing of non-combatants, but Yoshitsune ignored this precedent, and his merciless judgment produced results. The Taira were thrown into disorder. Not long after, the bay's current shifted and the Minamoto fleet began to gain the advantage. Some Taira warriors began to abandon their ships and attempt to flee to solid land, but Noriyori's presence on the eastern shore caught them between a rock and a hard place, and as their chances of victory began to slip away, their allies from Kyushu and Shikoku began to desert them as well. With defeat beginning to look inevitable, the preeminent members of the main Taira family began, one after another, to throw themselves into the sea, choosing death by drowning over capture and beheading at the hands of the Minamoto. Perhaps the saddest of these deaths was that of the young Emperor Antoku, still only six years old, who was carried to the bottom of the sea in the embrace of his grandmother, the late Kiyomori's widow. According to legend, just after being told that he needed to make his goodbyes to the world that he knew, Antoku innocently asked his grandmother where they were going, and she replied that they were headed to an imperial city beneath the waves. The pair would end up taking two of the three imperial treasures with them, and one of them, the Xanagi no Tsurugi sword, would never be recovered, 
It was in the midst of the Taira family's self-destruction that one of the more famous episodes from the battle, Yoshitsune's Hasso Tobi or Eight Boat Leap, is alleged to have taken place. The Taira family member and renowned warrior Taira no Noritsune had resolved that if he was going down, he was taking Yoshitsune with him, and so he tracked down the young Minamoto general and began attempting to deliver him a fatal blow. The sly Yoshitsune, however, refused to give Noritsune the pleasure of single combat, instead leaping six meters or about twenty feet, roughly the length of eight small boats, to a distant allied vessel and leaving his angry Taira foe in the dust. This episode is quite obviously fictional, but it has remained one of the most famous legends in the Yoshitsune canon and a popular subject of painting and sculpture. The Taira clan's leader, Munemori, is said to have watched in a daze as his fleet crumbled and his family died around him, paralyzed by the situation. According to legend, his subordinates, unable to watch their leader disgrace himself any further, finally pushed Munemori and his son into the water. But both being good swimmers, they failed to drown and were ultimately fished out of the sea by the Minamoto. They would eventually be executed, with Munemori famously breaking his chanting of the Nembutsu prayer just before the executioner's sword fell to frantically ask whether his son had gone before him or not. Munemori was widely regarded by later generations to have been an incompetent leader and a poor replacement for his father Kiyomori. But at the very least, the love he had for his family seems hard to question. With their final loss at the Battle of Dan no Ura, the Taira, or at least the most powerful and prestigious line of the Taira, had at last met their demise. One might assume that the victorious Yoritomo would now make his way to Kyoto and take his place at the retired emperor's feet as Kiyomori's spiritual successor and the new master of military matters for the imperial court. Indeed, this seems to have been what much of the Kyoto aristocracy expected to happen, but looking back in hindsight, it is clear that the status quo had already been upended far too violently for any return to normalcy to be realistic. Yoritomo, in his headquarters at Kamakura, had become something akin to a regional king of eastern Japan, and he was not in any rush to discard the power base he had spent the last five years building. That being said, much of Yoritomo's authority was derived from the unique, emergency-esque circumstances of the Genpei War, and with the conflict's end, it was unclear how and in what capacity he would maintain his position. Thankfully for Yoritomo, little brother Yoshitsune would come through one final time to save the day, though not at all in the way that Yoshitsune himself ever could have expected. As mentioned earlier, Dark clouds had already begun to appear in Yoritomo and Yoshitsune's relationship, thanks to the latter's accepting of court titles from retired Emperor Goshirakawa without permission. This disharmony between the half-brothers was further compounded by Yoshitsune's failure at Dan no Ura to capture Emperor Antoku alive or recover the sacred imperial sword, both of which would have been useful tools in post-war negotiations with the imperial court. Finally, Yoshitsune had also managed to get on the bad side of Yoritomo's close confidant, Kajiwara Kagetoki, as the two had often led troops together during the war and clashed over strategy disagreements on several occasions. More than anything though, Yoritomo likely had come to see Yoshitsune as a potential threat who had a good chance of being used against him by the crafty and devious Goshirakawa, who already clearly had his eye on the young man. A couple of months after the Battle of Dan no Ura, Yoshitsune made his way back to Kamakura with a number of Taira prisoners to present to his older brother. But while the prisoners were accepted into custody, Yoshitsune himself was refused entry to the city. In response, Yoshitsune penned a letter to Yoritomo asserting his loyalty, but still failed to be allowed entry into Kamakura, and after several weeks of waiting, he was at last ordered to return to Kyoto. As he departed the Kamakura area, a bitter Yoshitsune is reported to have called for all those bearing a grudge against Yoritomo to join up with him, and when Yoritomo caught wind of this, he ordered the confiscation of any and all territories awarded to Yoshitsune over the course of the war. As the months passed, Yoritomo's anger and suspicion toward Yoshitsune grew ever deeper, and in October of 1185, he at last sent a small force of Kamakura warriors to assault Yoshitsune's Kyoto residence with the intent of killing him. Yoshitsune and his followers managed to fight off this assassination squad, but it was now clear that there would be no reconciliation with Yoritomo. 
and so Yoshitsune turned to his royal patron, the retired emperor Goshirakawa, for aid. At Yoshitsune's urging, the retired emperor made the shocking decision to issue an imperial decree calling for Yoritomo's elimination, apparently having now decided that the Minamoto warlord was more trouble than he was worth. Sadly for Yoshitsune and Goshirakawa, however, the order failed to have much of a persuasive effect on the warriors of central Japan, and with his declaration of war out in the open but few actual troops to support his cause, Yoshitsune reluctantly opted to flee the city of Kyoto. He initially attempted to head west by boat but was shipwrecked by poor weather, an incident attributed in legend to the angry spirits of the drowned Taira and he would ultimately end up fleeing north and entering the protection of his old friends, the Oshu Fujiwara. Yoshitsune's misfire of a rebellion ended up being exactly what Yoritomo needed to take the position he had come to occupy during the Genpei War and establish it as a permanent fixture of Japan's new post-war social order. He sent his father-in-law, Hojo Tokimasa, down to the capital with a menacing escort of a thousand horsemen to politely inquire to the retired emperor why he had ever had such a silly thought as to call for the destruction of his good friend and loyal subject, Yoritomo. The panicked Goshirakawa flusteredly insisted that Yoshitsune had bullied him into issuing the anti-Yoritomo decree and that it didn't reflect his true feelings whatsoever. After bluntly telling the retired emperor that he found him to be just about the most arrogant oaf in the country by comparing him to a mythological beast called a Tengu, Yoritomo, via Hojo Tokimasa, demanded that the retired emperor make it up to him, if you will. Initially, Koshirakawa attempted to placate Yoritomo by reversing his recent decree and instead issuing a new one calling for the elimination of the fugitive Yoshitsune. However, Yoritomo, knowing he had Goshirakawa in a very vulnerable position, pressed the retired emperor further, and in 1185 he managed to extract an imperial sanction remembered as the Bunji no Chokkyo. With the ostensible goal of locating Yoshitsune, this imperial sanction gave Yoritomo permission to place his followers throughout the country in one of two new official positions, Shugo and Jito. Both positions would evolve over time, but the former, Shugo, was a military and policing position that operated on a province-wide scale. The latter, Jito, was a smaller scale position that placed one of Yoritomo's vassals in each of the smaller territories within a province. I will get into the gritty details of these more in later videos covering the Kamakura period. But what you need to know for now is that Yoritomo had been granted the approval to distribute his vassals permanently and officially throughout much of the country, greatly expanding his power and influence. The 1185 issuing of this imperial sanction is another event which is popularly brought up as the true starting point for the Kamakura Shogunate. For the next two years, the situation between Yoritomo and Yoshitsune remained at a tense standstill but the ball finally began to get rolling again when Yoshitsune's protector and the leader of the Oshu Fujiwara, the elderly Fujiwara no Hidehira, passed away near the end of 1187. Hidehira is said to have instructed his son and heir, Yasuhira, to continue to protect Yoshitsune no matter what happened, but unable to stand up to the pressure both from Yoritomo and from the imperial court, Yasuhira at last betrayed his guest in the early months of 1189. Yasuhira dispatched several hundred warriors to assault Yoshitsune's residence, which was by this point only occupied by Yoshitsune and about 20 or so followers. According to legend, Yoshitsune's loyal companion Benke was the last to be slain, famously remaining standing even after drawing his final breath, a pose some of you may be familiar with as having been referenced in a certain well-known manga. As his followers fought to buy him time, Yoshitsune entered the prayer hall of his residence with his wife and four-year-old daughter, whose lives he is said to have ended by his own hand before finally taking his own. Fujiwara no Yasuhira likely thought that he had saved his own skin by breaking his promise to his father and eliminating Yoshitsune, but Yoritomo was not a man who was so easily satisfied. Once again, the lord of Kamakura saw an opportunity ripe for the taking, and without even securing the approval of the retired emperor and the imperial court, he mustered together a massive army of his warriors and began marching on the Oshu Fujiwara. At a loss for how to respond, but powerless to actually do anything to halt the flow of events, 
Go Shirakawa would end up approving the campaign after the fact. Yoritomo's ostensible reason for his aggression was that the Fujiwara had already sealed their own fate by protecting the criminal Yoshitsune for so long, but his real motive was likely just the fact that the Oshu Fujiwara, with their near-independent control over northern Japan, were the last great military threat to him remaining in the country. For the first time in years, Yoritomo would lead his followers into battle himself, although the ensuing conflict was not nearly the great showdown one might have expected it to be. The Kamakura and Oshu forces would engage in one major clash, the three-day Battle of Atsukashiyama in the summer of 1189. But after Yoritomo's victory here, Yasuhira would choose to abandon any further fighting and instead attempt to flee further north, possibly as far as Hokkaido. However, while camped at Nienosaku in what is modern Akita Prefecture, Yasuhira was betrayed and murdered by his disillusioned subordinates and his head was delivered to Yoritomo, who had by this point already captured Hiraizumi. For Yoritomo, the campaign against the Oshu Fujiwara was not only an opportunity to destroy a powerful potential enemy and obtain a wide expanse of lucrative territory to distribute to his vassals, but it was also a chance to engage in something of a symbolic reenactment of the former Nine Years' War, fought by his and his followers' ancestors more than a century before. The significance of the fact that they were marching across the old battlefields of their forefathers under the descendant of those forefathers' general was almost certainly not lost on the Kamakura warriors, and it likely served to even further strengthen the lord vassal bonds upon which Yoritomo's nascent government was based. With the death of Yoshitsune and the fall of the Oshu Fujiwara, we officially reach the end of our tale. Yoritomo would go on to shore up his power as the leader of the Kamakura Shogunate over the next several years, eventually being invested by the imperial court with the title which gives the Kamakura Shogunate its name. This title, Seitai Shogun, was granted to Yoritomo in 1192, and it gave him a sort of nebulous yet imposing military authority, while allowing him to remain out east and maintain a healthy distance between himself and the capital. If you have watched my previous videos covering the Heian period, you will know that the office of Seitai Shogun was originally a temporary military command position given to the general in charge of leading campaigns against the native quote-unquote barbarian people of northeastern Japan. By the time of the Genpei War, the position was a dusty relic of a bygone era, and it was repurposed to give Yoritomo an official job title to go with his status as de facto chieftain of the warrior clans of eastern Japan. It should be noted that Yoritomo didn't receive this shogun title until shortly after the death of the old retired emperor Goshirakawa who, as the living representation of Japan's old order, had resisted the idea of such an appointment until the bitter end. When Goshirakawa died, in a sense, the last vestiges of the Heian era died with him, and while there are numerous theories as to when exactly Japan's next phase of history, the Kamakura period, actually began, to me, 1192 seems like the most appropriate choice. Before we go, I do want to leave you with one final little legend from the end of the Genpei War, especially for those of you upset about the demise of our tragic underdog hero, Yoshitsune. As we discussed a moment ago, Yoshitsune is officially said to have perished during Fujiwara no Yasuhiro's attack on his residence in 1189, but unofficially, legends remain throughout Japan that he and his followers actually managed to anticipate this attack and preemptively flee north. As a popular historical figure, it perhaps doesn't seem surprising that conspiracy theories would arise asserting his survival, but mysteriously, the local legends remain in towns and cities that form a very distinct line running north up to the Tsugaru Peninsula. The most ostentatious of these tales claim that Yoshitsune traversed the Tsugaru Strait to Hokkaido and then turned west to cross over to the Asian mainland, where he united the tribes of Mongolia and came to be remembered to history as none other than Genghis Khan. This story is, of course, preposterous, but it is fun to imagine when you consider that Yoshitsune and Genghis Khan's alleged birth years line up pretty well and that a century or so later, the Mongol Empire would end up presenting perhaps the greatest threat to the Kamakura Shogunate that they ever faced. <laughs>
Even if he didn't go on to become the Great Khan, it isn't nearly as much of a stretch to imagine that Yoshitsune made it up to Hokkaido and quietly lived out the remainder of his years with his family and war buddies. Or perhaps that is simply what I want to believe. If you made it to the end here, I want to thank you so much for watching. This video has been a heck of an undertaking, but it's also been one of the projects I've envisioned creating ever since I started this channel, and I'm really happy to have finally gotten it out into the world. It is the culmination of months of reading of numerous books and weeks on weeks of diving deep into digital library archives and stumbling through old, barely legible Japanese cursive to procure all these images. If you enjoyed the video, I would humbly request that you press that like button, subscribe to the channel for more future projects like this, and maybe even drop a comment for the YouTube algorithm. We'll be back to our regular series for a little while starting with the next video, which means that there should be a short summary for the Yayoi period as well as a long-form video covering the first phase of the Kamakura period coming relatively soon. As always, thanks for watching, have a great day, and... Ooh, you know